thanks very much for joining me. I really appreciate um, you coming on for a chat uh, because when I heard that you did um, a round robin around Ireland and visit all the distilleries, I thought, oh my God, what an interesting, interesting idea. Uh, I would love to do that. And how long did it take you? Like, was it like eight days, 20, 20 days? Oh boy, if I could do it in eight days, 24 days. 24 to, days. To do that. 24 days, 44 distilleries uh, officially, but then I also visited with some people who are starting distilleries or have products that uh they put out so that's cool um, that may or may not have distilleries in the future so yeah, 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 it, yeah. that's what made it so hard to write a book about it because it's like oh you know i mean how many distilleries do i say i actually visited yeah. and i never really had a uh my spreadsheet was getting longer and longer everybody i talked to so it's crazy yeah i know now we're jumping around 10 steps ahead here so let's pull it back a small bit sure. um I've been listening to your podcast for a number of months now. Uh, you've got two podcasts. You've got the Whiskey Lore, the, the stories, is it? Whiskey Lore stories. Whiskey Lore stories, yep. And Whiskey Lore uh, interviews. Um, and as I was saying, Cha, um, in take one, <laughs> I, really enjoy, <laughs> I really enjoy the interviews. Um, that's, a, that's a really good podcast. Uh, I, I think you really go in depth. And, um, and I'm going to give you a massive compliment here because a lot of Americans that talk about Irish whiskey. Yeah it's a bit tone deaf. Um, mm. They don't hit the nail on the head and they're kind of talking a little bit of a blarney. Yeah. You don't, you actually know what you're talking about. Like when you speak, you speak with authority in Irish whiskey um, and, and you know, the nuances and the history and why things are the way they are, you know? Um, uh, and that's, that's unusual. So um, if I'm going to give you one compliment and that's the only <laughs> belly rub, you get in the whole thing now, right? I but, really um, appreciate that. Well, no, honestly, just, like, and, and you can really speak with authority in Irish whiskey, which is brilliant. It's fantastic to listen to as well, you know? I think this is the challenge for me is trying to uh, learn as much as I can about each style of whiskey, about each country, and really to stay diverse and mm. respect each and understand each. Because I come from a area where if you don't drink bourbon, you're not drinking whiskey. And, yeah. you know, I mean, that that kind of thing that mentality is what I'm trying to break down. And I feel like the only way I can do that is by being educated in each style of whiskey. So my hope is ultimately someday I can speak to scotch that way. I can speak yeah. to American single malt that way. I can talk to, you know, whatever country uh, that I'm, I'm speaking with that I have a good sense. And Ireland was a weakness for me. So because a lot of what I knew about Irish whiskey is just what I heard in the States and we don't really have a wide selection of yeah. Irish whiskey here. So it's hard to be educated on it. And so you get a lot of those. What is pot still whiskey? In fact, most people don't even go, what is pot yeah. still whiskey? They just buy red breast and they're happy. Yeah. That's a, that's a really <laughs> nice Irish malt, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's difficult, I think for the smaller brands in Ireland, you know, I mean, I know, they struggle really hard with having to um, uh, get through each of the the state um, um, import laws and and taxes and I mean it's it's an absolute nightmare. I know from talking to people and even when you do see some of the distilleries and even some of the larger distilleries, they might only be in four or five states because that's all the kind of workload they can actually handle. Um, it's just such a large market and so complex. Um, but it's it's great to see when the smaller guys do um breakthrough you know and and you see them taking a small little foothold here and and gain a little foothold there like i know in ohio you know like um uh they really have started to embrace irish whiskey yeah uh, in no in no small part to uh, barry chandler's kind of um <laughs> prof uh, prophesizing you know uh, um to, to the masses um but the smaller guys like Killone and Two Stacks and 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 uh, Sleeve League with the Silky, those people are known about, you know. And it's yeah. great to see kind of uh, that those little footholds taken taken hold, you know. It was kind of fun to go up to. I, I joke that I go to Kentucky to buy my Scotch and my yeah. Irish whiskey because in my state I'm in a control state, and this is just a leftover from Prohibition, where they're basically you know some states can get whatever they want, but a state like mine it's all down to the liquor board and what are they going to allow into the state and what, you know, it's down to distributors and what distributors can be in the state really? and all of so that. So they only allow certain brands. And if you're in favor or, 
um, you're part of the club, you, you get let in really. Yeah. So North Carolina, which is where I grew up, North Carolina is much more strict. They actually supply all the stores. So okay. it all has to go through them. And so if they don't want a particular whiskey in, or they just don't have a relationship with that particular, mm. you know, and, and South Carolina is different because in South Carolina, where I am now, uh, the it's distributors, what distributors can be in here. And so if the distributor hasn't been approved by the state, then they're not going to be selling. And I, it, I don't think it's that they necessarily want to keep a brand out or a distributor out. It's just that those distributors have to lobby to get in mm. and that extra step when you're somebody like Daryl McNally and Limavati, and he's, you know, he did a whole trek across the United States yeah. trying to open up markets. This is kind of what you end up having to do. And if you're not going to go through a distributor or your distributor is, you know, fighting to get into these states. So it's, uh, unfortunately, prohibition has not treated us very well over time, but we do have some states like Kentucky and Tennessee that are wide open. So it makes it worth traveling there to fill up your cart. <laughs> It's such such a shame when fun is uh, politicized, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. It just kind of takes the cake, takes the love out of it. You know, um, I'm starting to kind of try and educate myself on American whiskeys and bourbons as well. Um, I've got a particular grow for Old Forester Prohibition at the moment. Um, I managed to get well. My wife actually managed to get a few bottles secretly for me for my birthday back. Um, <laughs> it's good stuff. It's good stuff. You know. Yeah um it's fantastic actually i was gonna say my go-to house whiskey if you come over to the house and i pull the decanter out it's old forester 100 signature which is oh, there. Cool. yes and to me i mean it's uh complex it's interesting and those are things you don't normally hear so much with bourbons mm. you know that complexity because uh i like to say one of the reasons why I probably lean towards other whiskeys outside of bourbon more is because the flavor profile kind of sticks in a, a narrow range yeah. with bourbon. And if you're comfortable with that, fantastic. But I'm somebody who's always trying to find a new flavor and something. And Sam. Yeah. 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 Um, where did you start? What was the first distillery you went to when you hit Ireland? So I, I actually did two trips. My first trip to Ireland was in 2019 and that trip, um, you're, you're going to love this. Uh, I basically was going to Scotland to go to distilleries because I had just finished my Kentucky bourbon trip where I did like 19 distilleries in cool. eight days. And so then I was going to Scotland and I thought, well, I'm flying into Dublin and then to Glasgow. Why don't I take four days and just see some of Ireland? But I was calling it my castles and drams tour. I was doing a travel podcast at the time and, and I said, okay, well, I'm going to I'm going to hunt through the southern part of Ireland for the best Guinness, because in my opinion, Ireland was for beer and Scotland was for whiskey. <laughs> so I know those are fighting words, but um, so I went to a bunch of distilleries. I hope, I hope you came to the conclusion that Beamish is the best Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Um no, but actually, it was on this trip. That Beamish, I found is a, the best Beamish, Guinness, is a, so. Beamish and Murphy's would be a kind of a cork stout, you know. Uh, Guinness, nice, yeah. Guinness would be viewed as a as a Dublin stout. Um, down, down okay. in Cork, yeah, yeah. So say, like, <laughs> Beamish is the best Guinness, you know. <laughs> yeah, I was at a Boston Red cheap. Sox. I was at a Boston Red Sox game, uh, and I came back out, and there were two brewery or two uh, bars across from each other, and I went to one, and I ordered. A Guinness and he said well we only have Murphy's they have Guinness oh, cool. across the street and I said uh, okay pour me uh, a Murphy's he said it's just like Guinness and then I tasted it and I went no it's not just like Guinness if you drink Guinness all the time then you you get the differences in it but uh... no like the, 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 <laughs> there was a huge it was a famous um, advertising campaign for years with Murphy's um, around Cork and around Munster and uh, the whole tagline was smooth like you know, I was uh, so we like to think it's a small bit smoother than um than uh, Guinness. Okay. Um, we won't talk about smooth whiskeys. Like okay, yeah, we won't like, do that. I, oh, I don't I'm like good. that word. That's I am such good a with bad you on that. Descriptor. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. I actually me. talk. I actually talk about it in the book because I say uh, I do a little side note on it and say you know I get why people use the word smooth, 
but it shows that you don't really dive deep into what a whiskey is about and mm. that smooth can be used for so many different things that mm. it, you know, it, it, it's just not a quality word. If you can dig in a little deeper and say, why is it smooth? Mm. Uh, that then you're doing much better in terms of uh, relating to other people with a whisk. What's the advantage of that whiskey versus another, but smooth gives me absolutely no description about um, a spirit. It gives me, it gives me nothing to go on, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if you said it was easy drinking, I'd say, oh, okay, okay. Maybe, maybe the spikes are rounded out in the spirit. Do so, you know what I mean? Give me something, but smooth. I don't know. Yeah. Smooth, yeah. <laughs> Murphy's a smooth light, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I did go to one distillery while I was there. So I was going uh, to, to all the different castles I could go to. And then I went to uh, Dingle, which was great because Dingle oh. is closed for visitors at this point. So I wouldn't have been able to go on this last trip. So that was the only Irish distillery I went to. I'm was glad Dingle. you I'm glad you said something that I had on the back shelf because I was nice. I was looking for go. an opening drink. So this is the um I think it's actually probably the latest Dingle release from Irish Malts. It's the Irish Malts exclusive. Um, okay. Um own liquid, of course, cast strength, uh Alrosso cask, and this is eight years old to my okay. old, nearly eight years old. I think it's eight years old. Yes, I was um, gonna say the uh, oldest one they had when I was there was uh, they were just coming out with batch five, yeah. so yeah, they were still uh, still waiting to get into their older whiskeys. Um, this is a kind of a new newer direction they're going. You know, I think they had a German exclusive. They had one with Irish malts. I can't remember the third one. Oh, I can. Was this Carriot in Killarney? I think John Fleming had one. Am I speaking out of turn? I think okay. it was carry out in Killarney. Um, but yeah, this is a new kind of um, distillery single cask. So it's not a founding father's cask. It's not a sons and daughters, which are all single casks. But this is a distillery single cask uh, done for um, a retail partner, we'd say. And I really like this. Um, this is actually uh, very good. Does does it look, I'll, I'll call them out. There's a few iffy dingles out there. Um, <laughs> yeah. This isn't one of them. This this really, really surprised me. Um, so I'm glad we're starting with the dingle tonight. Um, yeah, I, I will uh, I will enjoy it through uh, osmosis here. I actually have a Writer's Tears. Uh, oh, lovely. Cop, uh, double oak with me. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you cannot go wrong with a Writer's Tears. Um, no. It, it really was actually... one of the best blends out there, isn't it? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, when I started with Irish whiskey, I just was... Um, my opinion was low because the only stuff that I had been uh, come across were the Jameson and Bushmills, just the regular uh, versions. What about, what like, about Tom uh, Moore Jew? Would, 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 would that have been around? Um, uh, it was well? around, but you know what's funny is I don't know whether uh, it would have been around 2019 that I had it. And a friend of mine had a bottle and I tasted it. And I, I kept having this opinion that every time I taste an Irish whiskey, it seems to have a, a solvent note to it that okay. was like a, that just was not hitting my palate right and that hmm. seemed even stronger in that Tullamore Dew what's funny is I went to Tullamore Dew was the first place I went to on this trip did you and yeah. I enjoyed everything that I I had there so I don't know hmm. whether this was maybe the early days of uh, Grant taking it over and uh, maybe it was still a younger version coming out of their own selection or what but for some yeah. reason that initial run on Tullamore do I wasn't that impressed by yeah maybe they were dealing in stills I don't know <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, um, this is William, the hard part William Grant knows what they're doing right in fairness yeah um, absolutely I, I still think they're, they're, they're still trying to find their feet with um, pot still and still trying to get their head around it I think mm -hmm. Tullamore do you know um, you what know, I loved about the, what they're doing though is that they have separate pot stills for making single malt and for single pot still so they have mm -hmm. six stills okay, with three set up for one and three set up for the other. Mm. And Maybe they're that's different shapes. Like different shapes. Oh. Yeah. I haven't been to the new Tullamore Jew uh, distillery, so I'm, I'm learning here. Yeah, it's really nice. It's, uh, I mean, I in my book, I talk about which distilleries you might go to. If you had only one distillery you could go to mm. uh, and you were learning about Irish whiskey, that would be a good one because the uh, – they, they start you off with an Irish coffee. Uh, they tell you the story of Irish coffee, the history of Irish coffee. 
and then they walk you through into that new distillery and you get a chance to go you drive by the column still that they have outside and then you spend some time in the warehouse um i would have loved to have taken some pictures in the warehouse but they don't let cameras in there so yeah that's the <laughs> that's the sad part but um uh, when you were in dingle was um had graham cool taken over at that point no oh, it so was just that, came before graham michael michael, michael walsh Stiller. and it was yeah, funny because yeah. i got to meet him at boan while i was up in uh yeah yeah dry us, he's so. um i like michael um very interesting distiller um always looking to push the envelope i think you know coming in from the uh, at coming in at the ground level in dingle and then getting qualified you know um and being kind of groomed into the position and then through his work with Fanon, his collaboration with Fanon in, in Boan, you know, I think Michael Walsh has really, really um put himself up there as um um one of the kind of leading innovators in the country, you know, uh, for distilling. Um there's so many people doing interesting things, so many distillers doing interesting things. Michael is right up there, I think, with them, you know, and uh, I think he deserves uh, all the credit that he's he's getting of late, you know. Yeah, it's it was interesting because when I walked in and I talked to Sally Ann first and then I, I walked over and started talking to Michael and he said, well, we'll just talk about the pot stills here for, for a little bit and then we'll go up and we'll do some samples. Uh, this won't take too long. Well, how many how many times did he say nanotechnology? <laughs> I didn't count, but I can tell you that we we talked for about two hours before we finally got upstairs. And then once we got upstairs, uh, we did a little bit of tasting and talked about what they had done uh, in terms of the different mash bills. Yeah. And then we talked for another. He basically asked me, where are you going? And then introduced me to every distiller I was going to meet along Fantastic. the way before I went. And uh, I was meeting John Teeling the next day and I was thinking, I'm a little nervous about this. Stuff. Yeah. He said, he said, he'll make you, he, he made me tea the first time we uh, <laughs> yeah, chatted yeah, with each other. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. No worries. Do you know, I'm, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad that, you know, I, I just get this constant reminder of how um, I, th I think James Darty puts it best um, that the Irish whiskey industry has got this collegiate, um uh, kind of culture uh, within the industry you know it's still burgeoning it's still small um everyone's still kind of small you know except three or four of the big lads and everyone's kind of you know um uh, wishing each other the best and trying to further because they understand that, that you know the, the rising tide and all that but um i love that you got that sense um you know from from michael as well you know and everyone yeah. is does wish each other the best you know and, and wants to kind of um show people how good irish whiskey is in the category is you know yeah you, so, you sort of like you feel like you've uh dived into the playbook after you go to a bunch of distilleries and you hear that quote rising tide lifts all boats over and over oh, really? and okay. over again throughout the island yeah i'm glad i'm glad yeah i'm, I'm glad yeah. that's really good um that's a really good little um thing to take away um so that was your first trip you came to dingle and um i actually must say no i haven't tried this in a while uh, in a couple of you know, two months yeah this is love actually you. this is better than i remember um love your, and i know uh, this sold out really really quickly love your capita uh, uh that is a causeway collection uh, i believe it's a grappa glass from okay. bushmills that they gave ah. out with a certain pack yeah i managed to get my hands on one um lovely i love uh, I love glassware. Um, I really <laughs> think that glassware, like, you know, I choose my glassware very carefully when I'm, when I'm um, depending on the spirit that I'm drinking, I think it does uh, impact the uh, impacts, the experience massively. I think it really does, you know? Yeah. So I've got every shape and size glass going. Yeah. As you can tell, I'm a, when I went to get them branded, I went the, with the Capitas because I just love the, uh, I love the shape of it. Yeah, and look, I mean, you know, the big boys, um, that's that's their go-to glass Middleton. Um, every tasting you go to, it's all Capitas. I need to kind of um the glass where they hand out as well, you know, the the point of sale stuff, it's all Capitas. So I mean you're not going you're not going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so uh that's pretty dark whiskey there. So it's spent some time in that Oloroso Sherry barrel, it looks like. I think it's full maturation. Is it? Yes, it is. It's full maturation. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Nice. Oh, this is a, this is a very good whiskey. I had heard that they were doing a champ when I was there, they talked about a champagne 
barrel that they had they were using and that they were going to let it age for over 10 years it'd be interesting to know if that's experiment is still going on or not i bet you it is i mean graham graham spent 20 i don't know how many uh he's an old fecker now so he's probably closer to 30 years i suppose in, in uh, the scottish industry he's very old affla um <laughs> but graham graham um brought huge experience with him you know um especially off cask management with glenn murray and stuff um um was Glenn Murray and what is it? Glenn Fiddick, I think, or uh, anyway, he's definitely with Glenn Murray for a long time, but um, uh, brought that huge knowledge of cask management. And I know that he's instituted huge uh, diversity in the cask program as well, you know, um, for Dingle for the future. Um, and also, amazingly, uh, Dingle has peated, um, has peated malt, and I believe pot still. Uh, he's got peated spirit anyway, laid down. Um, yeah. that's I'd say it's a, just about to mature. I think it's nearly whiskey at this stage. Uh, and I, I've tried, I tried it when I was very young and mm-hmm. my God, it's fantastic. You know, really? Um, I think Graham cool just has brought an extra layer of awesomeness to, to, uh, Dingle Distillery. Nice. Yeah. It's, no, in, it's interesting. It's interesting to see like, uh, Brian Watts, when I got to talk to him and the, the idea you? of these, yes. And these guys, he took me on the tour through great Northern, which oh, is lucky fan- fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It was very and sad it, to hear of his um, passing. It, very sad. I, I never, I never yeah. met him, so I'm, I'm, uh, I miss it. I, I missed out. Yeah, he's very welcoming, and uh, like I said, it, you could tell he was excited about all the things he was working on. And we went down in the tasting lab, and he was pulling out bottle of this, bottle of that, asking me what I liked. Oh, I and, heard, uh, I heard that story you told. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that story again? It was, it was a well, bottle from. He ended up bringing out a bottle from Kilbegan. And this was a bottle that was basically the whiskey had sat in a barrel somewhere in a deep, dark corner for 75 years. Right. And then they put this into this bottle and he let me have a taste of it. And he said, he was right up front, but he said, this isn't the best whiskey you're ever going to mm. taste. But he said, it's just fascinating to see what distillers were doing back then and kind of and the fact that this survived for 75 years Mm. in a barrel he said the wood was almost petrified by the time they Mm. pulled it out and i was shocked because i expected it to be an oak bomb and it was fruity uh it It was fresh really yes it just absolutely stunned survived yeah 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 so uh so fun and and to find out they actually had a, a female master distiller there at the time who distilled that and so it's like all these little pieces of history mm. that are interesting that we don't know because distillers back then really didn't they didn't see themselves as somebody somebody was going to be researching years later and want to tell the story of so yeah yeah it's the fun I, part I, of it i wonder were they well paid back then or was it just a kind of um Good industry to be in if you enjoy the wee drop, you know. Um, yeah, there was a few perks I'd say to that job, you know. But I wonder was was it a was it a well paid job, you know, or was it just kind of um, um, just a few Joe soaps, um, doing an apprenticeship essentially, you know? But I, I'd say that's probably more more likely. Um, yeah, well, I I see from my research that most distillers back then didn't really take on the master distiller mm-hmm. moniker. They they were just running a distillery. Yeah. Nowadays, master distiller has become kind of an ambassador position rather than being somebody who's actually in there doing that. You know, talking to Jack Daniels, uh, and you know, a switch from one distiller to the next. When then Jeff Arnett was there, he didn't like going out and doing all the meets and doing. He wanted to just manage the distillery and you know come up with things. And now Chris Fletcher, the guy who replaced him, is much more comfortable with the public. So he's kind of filling that role. But I mean, not everybody can be a, a John Teeling or a um, you know a Richard Patterson for Scotland. Or you know, it's, it's some people have that personality, some don't. And uh, it's just interesting to see how the master distiller role in a lot of places has become kind of this show position mm. where you are the ambassador rather than the guy who's keeping your and that's why you know brian when i was talking to him you know i said uh master distiller and he said no no i'm production director 
you know, that's what he wanted to be. And uh, he was very personable and he yeah. could have easily have slipped into the other role. But somebody told me, uh, did you get a picture with him? And I said, no. And they said, getting a picture with him was really difficult. <laughs> so I think in a way he kind of liked, he was friendly, but he kind of liked his privacy. So. Yeah. Yeah. A quiet giant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But Brian Watts, we'll, uh, we'll toast Brian Watts. Um, gone too, gone too soon. Slange. Slange. Mm. I loved, um, nice. I loved listening to yourself and, uh, James Darkey's chat. Um, and you were, you know, you, you were speaking, um, about pronunciations and the kind of nuance of dialect. And, um, that's a really interesting little angle to, to go into, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I love that they're kind of creating their own um, organic region in the northwest of the country, you know, where they're kind of bringing back the the peat, um, the peated malts and the peated pot stills and the peated pot chains. Mm-hmm. Um, peated pot chain here now and oh, I'll crack go. into it straight away. But um, nice. I think I'd wash my palate out. I'll save it for the end. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as well, you know. But there I was going to say, I, I don't know if I have anything peated back here, which is uh, is shocking for me. But since no, I don't have that's uh, not true. I'm looking at a calamari there. Yeah, although the bottle is long gone, so th- <laughs> that was my that was my introduction to uh, when I was trying to get into Irish whiskey. Initially, I was like, I've got to find a peated Irish whiskey because I'm such a, a peat head that I think it would be a good entry for me mm. to really start diving in. Uh, and I do have a fun story about that. I was actually in Dublin on at the end of my trip, and my French teacher has been keeping up with me uh, and my travels. And she said, um, you know, one of my students uh, was actually is an artist in Dublin. And you, sh- you two should get together and, and have something, uh, have dinner or something. So I'm like, okay, this is weird. I'm in Dublin. I'm meeting up with somebody I went to high school with, but I never knew really. I knew her brother. Um, and so she and her husband show up at a, at a pub and we're sitting there. She says, what whiskey would you recommend? And, you know, she said, I'm not a whiskey drinker and I don't really know where to start. And I said, um, do you like like barbecue and things like that? And she said, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm like, I'm going for it. Oh, uh, you should start with, in there. Oh my God. You should start with the Connemara. And she <laughs> went was brave. Yes. And uh, so she, or, I said, if you order it, I said, the first thing you want to do is nose it. And what you're going to do is throw out everything you know about whiskey. And you are going to smell this like you're smelling something savory like your, you know, that whole idea of being out barbecue and and the rest. And um, if you don't like it, I'll, I'll take it and uh, drink it instead. And so what's funny is her husband went over to go order a a whiskey and she came back, he came back. And uh, when he came back to the table, he said, Ooh, and I got the Connemara 12. And I said, no, 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 don't get that. Don't get that. I said, that kills all the smoke off. You don't want that. Go get the, you know, um get the regular and so uh he goes back and and changes the order and then she takes it she puts it to her nose and i said just think smoke and she she was like to her husband smell this smell this yeah and uh she immediately was she she loves it she's she tasted it it. so it was amazing class and yeah and so she sends me messages on instagram occasionally I'm enjoying this bottle. Boy, this <laughs> bottle is really good. That's cool. And it's funny because I just recently did a, uh, I was doing a little brand work for Brooklade and I was at a barbecue, bourbon and barbecue fest. And I'm like the one, one of a couple scotches that that's there. And we had the classic Lottie and we had the heavily peated. And I just said, bourbon drinker, you like barbecue? Come over here. And so that was my whole thing was to talk people into drinking smoky whiskey and they all liked it and they liked it because I got them in the mindset of you're a bourbon drinker. Yes. You love to grill. You love, you know, your Saturday afternoons, uh, cooking up some, uh, you know, hamburgers or whatever. This is a perfect addition to that. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, it's the fun part is 
opening people's eyes, especially people who go, oh, I don't like smoky whiskey. Well, maybe you haven't been approaching it the right way. And, um, and, and then just getting them in that mindset just makes a huge difference. I think um, a lot of people of a certain vintage in Ireland who would have visited our grandparents in the countryside, you know, growing up and got them for the summers like I would, will remember the open turf fires mm. and, you know, walking in and, and the, the walls are, you know, <laughs> semi-blackened from the smoke in the room and just that that pungent, turfy, um, umami, aromatic. Mm. Oh, I just like when I smell it, it just instantly I'm back. Like you know, in that <laughs> big open fire and and the range over there, you know, and it's amazing. Like you know, like I remember my grand Jesus. Like she get up at eight in the morning, and the fire was going by quarter past. You know, because um, that heated the house, it heated the water, it cooked in it. <laughs> you know, it was it was a whole ritual. You know what I mean? So it was always always even in the middle of summer, you couldn't cook it out the the range. You know what I mean? So um even though it was all the windows were open the range was still on you know <laughs> yeah but um, yeah. that smell of turf i think is very um familiar to irish people you know um maybe over 30 odd years old who'd, who'd remember the days you know when we we're allowed to burn turf you know because yeah. uh, it's <laughs> yeah. kind of getting a bit rare these days you know that's the challenge these days yeah, yeah. so when, when did your second trip uh when did you come back for your second trip how, how so, uh, recent second second trip was in may Okay. So, yep. And I, like I said, I started uh, early May by the end of, well, I left June 1st. So that was uh, the 11th, I think I got there. So, yeah. So you I flew mean, into Dublin. Flew yeah. into Dublin, rented a car. North or south? Which way did you go? So I went north. Okay. Race. Yeah. Well, actually, I went to Tullamore Dew first, but then I went up to, um, let's see, then I went up, oh, I went to Slane, Old Carrick Mill, and, um, uh, Oh, and Boan is my, okay. uh, that was day two Yeah, yeah. for me. Day so one Midlands, was. You're in kind of West Forest Midlands, right? Yeah. I figured, well, Tullamore, the way you have to work this thing out, if you're going to do that many distilleries, is you find the distilleries that are open on Sunday and you have to schedule those for Sunday and then the yeah. rest. And like Kilbegan, I could have done on a Sunday because they do the shorter tour, but I wanted the longer tour. Okay. So, I mean, that was a place I was really looking forward to going to. So I didn't want to waste it. So I've got uh, a Kilbegan here. And this actually is, I believe, their own liquid. Okay. Uh, so this is the distillery exclusive. Um, oh, nice. This was, yeah, it's 11 years old, ex-bourbon cask, 53.5%. Uh, but yeah, this is the distillery exclusive. And um, I hope I'm not speaking our term. I believe this is their own actual liquid um, okay they haven't i don't think they've released it commercially yet um but they, they did have it in the distillery and it was, um it was very interesting to see that that distillery has a wood mash tun that is mm -hmm. the only distillery i've ever seen with a wooden mash tun and that's not there's in the, the old section that's in yeah. the that's in the new section there's so. plenty of wooden mash tons, but if um if you peek inside, it's a it's a big steel uh, steel, big steel pot. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's interesting, actually. Yeah, they have to do a lot of work to keep those clean. Yeah. So, um, did you go into the old part of the Kilbegan Distillery? It's cool, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I was lucky. I, love... I had somebody who was really a huge history fan take me through there, and that they were smart to do that because I had a lot of questions. <laughs> so, uh, it was good to be able to see all that stuff. But, love uh, being around old mechanics um uh do you know that that smell of dust and grease and that's old smell of oil uh, yeah. love seeing that and even the old machinery i mean you, you can see that um when you go to middleton um if you go inside the old oh what building is it um this one where the water wheel is in front of the uh archive the Silas yeah. cottage um but you go inside there and you see where the water wheel turned all the gears and the cogs mm. and the shafts and you see the generator and then that connects onto, oh my God, I love seeing all that kind of stuff, you know, it's amazing. Yeah. Mm. That took me, uh, it actually took me back to my youth because we used to, I'm from Detroit originally, and we used to go to a cider mill. And mm. so those big wooden water wheels and all the gears running inside and you know i mean it's just uh it was just a flashback for me to my youth to see all of that but then it's all like iron 
in there. So we're going back into a completely different era. And so cool that the town thought to take care of that equipment and not let yes. it uh, go to waste or uh, to disrepair. Um, I've I seen pictures of the current ongoing renovation of Ahaskra, um, sort of creating the distillery in Ahaskra. Um, I think I'm not, I think I'm run, remembering this right. This got the river running through. Is it the center of the building or down the yeah. side of the building? But yeah, I think they're the actually have they got a water wheel they're integrating into the into the, the build as well, I believe. Yeah. Um it's great to see that kind of stuff, you know. Oh, absolutely. My, my dogs well, have joined me. They um they insist, <laughs> they, they insist on disturbing every single podcast they ever. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So it's like uh well, that's what's cool is that there are distilleries that maybe the building that they're in doesn't have a history mm. associated with whiskey but like crawley is in an old doll factory yeah. up in donegal and that uh, the fact that it was a carpet mill at one time too and as a carpet mill that they used to make that they had made carpet for the titanic so uh mm. you know just these little pieces of history that they can tell and the idea that you know they're going to have food there so you mm. can taste local fare I think for, you know, especially Americans coming over who maybe have some family roots over there, the fact that they can come back to a distillery that, yeah. yes, that that's a new distillery, but it's telling the story of the area and it's giving them an opportunity to kind of experience the culture. I think that's a, a great addition as well and in, into the whiskey I landscape. Think... I think Crawley are going to be very successful. I mean, they're on the Wild Atlantic Way Road itself. Um, one of the three owners, I think, is a local restaurateur as well. You know, so, um, you know, they're in the industry; they know what the crack is. Um, and their stills are gorgeous, aren't they? The uh, oh, yeah. those French brandy stills. Yeah. Uh, the Sharon, I think they're Charentes stills, are they? Anyway, they're the French brandy stills. They're bloody gorgeous and fired Beautiful. stills. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> who, who, like you? Just you, you can't knock. Um someone who goes to the effort, expense and um, hassle of direct firing. You know, there's only a few distilleries around the country, direct firing. We've got Crawley, we've got Boyluck, um, we've and got Killowen. Killowen and yep. I th that, oh no, I sorry, no. We've got the Burren Distillery as well in County Clare, um, our direct firing. Oh, yeah, that's true, that's true, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, I think that's it, am I right? Yeah. I don't think I'm forgetting yeah. anyone. I think that's well, it. Well, and I mean, in terms of me seeing direct fired, I've only seen two outside. There's one in uh, Kentucky and there's one in Tennessee that mm. I've run into, but it's not something you see very often. That's for sure. Have we got, um, is a spring bank, uh, direct fire in Scotland, I believe in yeah. Camden. Yeah. And oh, so there's a few, but they're outliers. They are outliers, you know? Yeah. So funny. I just interviewed, uh, in interviewed them, uh, recently and, I love the history of Campbelltown. And I love mm. that when I was going through Northern Ireland, that, that the familiarity of mm. those two regions mm. with each other. And that when I was talking, Glens of Antrim is going to have a distillery coming up and he's talking about the relationship with Campbelltown. And I'm like, this is great. I mean, it's, I would love to see the two industries not necessarily fight against each other, but get to a point where, uh, especially in Northern Ireland and in Kintyre uh, and Isla, there could be some, you know, mutual uh, tourism opportunities between because you you can stand at Lafroig on a clear day and see the coast of Ireland. Yeah. So, I mean, and as I dig into the history and really research it, the more I find out that these two areas really, they were part of a kingdom and well, they are, yeah. Yeah. And they are very, very well related with each other mm -hmm. in terms of, in fact, I had this whole thing while I was going around Ireland where I was trying to determine whether this myth about the Dublin four spelling the whisk spelling whiskey with an e and that mm. they were the ones that that started spelling with whiskey with an e well i did some research come to find out going through old newspapers uh that ulster was the area that did not spell whiskey with an e for the most part and that the rest of 
Ireland all the way back. I was finding newspapers from the 1700s in Waterford that were spelling whiskey with an E. Mm. So it's uh, it's been spelled with an E in all areas except for uh, up around Ulster mostly. Yeah. And I think that's because, again, the relationship between Ulster and Scotland yeah. is a lot tighter, mm. uh, not just because of what happened uh, you know, o- over the last couple of centuries, but just that is, a re- they are related to each other. There is a close tie between those two cultures. Yeah. Mm. So eight, eight centuries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, and- yeah, it's, it look, it, it, when you're trying to figure out, I mean, you know, trying to see through and pick apart the uh, political um reasons behind certain things you know it's 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 very difficult to understand to be honest with you you know um um but i think i mean the best explanation i've heard about the spelling is um down to literacy you know people mm. just couldn't spell i mean you know people are concentrating on one word but I'll go look at a different word and yeah. see how many different spellings of that word there was as well you know so i think um people didn't get hung up on that word i think it was most words they just had a bit of difficulty <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, it yeah. depends on your literacy i think you know well, and things things evolve because what I found was that England initially spelled whiskey with an E, and then the it was spelled with an E in the uh, colonies, but then it slowly went to without an E in mm. the U.S. in the 1800s. Okay. So there's a lot of brands. If you look at your old Forrester bottle, it's going to spell whiskey without an E, yeah. and the reason and the reason it does that is because that is a brand that came from a time period when they didn't spell whiskey with an e now Mm. if you ask brown foreman and their marketing team they're going to tell you that the reason they spell it without an e is because of their scotch heritage but you know that maker's mark it's an interesting story but uh and maybe probably truer with maker's mark because that's a newer brand but you know it's just an evolution and there was a point where england finally just sided with scotland and decided to drop the e and you know it's just uh it's down to evolution but if you look at the early spellings you're right they're all over the place i mean yeah. they spelled it with two e's at the end or you know any number of ways that they would spell it so i was looking at a bottle of uh patty centenary on my table earlier on and i just happened to notice as part of the kind of ye olde design on the back on the front of the wooden box um old irish whiskey spelled with a y i was like oh it's a interesting <laughs> little you know so yeah yeah, yeah. Paddy, i think even it... patty used to be uh without an e yeah, I think uh, there's a, a distillery, the uh, the almond distillery that uh, was down in Skibbereen, I think, or it was in that Bandon, area in Bandon. Yes, and um, they've they've spelled it both ways, mm-hmm. so you yeah. can find things that they were advertising that were spelled one way or the other. Uh, Peter Mulryan and I got into that discussion over Blackwater because he was yeah, yeah. kind of up in the air as to which way he was going to spell it, and. Uh, I was kind of lobbying him to not put the E in, but then I discovered this thing about, well, you know, I thought maybe they were spelling it without an E in Ireland up to a point, but then I did my research and I'm like, oh man, I wish I hadn't been lobbying so hard for that because it's (laughs) really kind of cool that now I'm discovering that, you know, it wasn't John Jameson and, uh, you know, the the Dublin Four that came up with this, we're just going to spell with an E for quality. (laughs) <laughs> Dublin whiskey. It's better than the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. So did you so when you went up north, um, you hit up Dunville's, I'd imagine. Uh you went up Ecklenville and Dunville's. You hit up Ecklenville and you hit up Cologne. Yeah, I did. Uh what was interesting was I went to Great Northern and Cologne in the same day. That okay. was like <laughs> two day, yeah. ends of the spectrum from you know uh hundreds of thousands of barrels to just uh here he's over in the shed making himself some uh malted oats i'm like isn't malted oats such a romantic little oh, yeah. distillery yeah. isn't it i mean it's and just, he's if, if if you were to paint a picture of um some quaint irish distillery in the hills i mean he just nailed it didn't he it's Absolutely. just amazing love that Absolutely. distillery yeah. um i'm just pouring a, a drop of cologne there and i was speaking about brendan's place uh, yeah. So this is the um, dark rum finishing a peated cask. I don't know nice. if you've got to try this. Yeah. So Irish rum, um, not whiskey. Okay. 
Uh, yeah. yeah, amazing. Love his experiments. He is doing a lot of different uh, interesting things. In fact, we walked out to his shed and he had, um, I want to say- not, they, Were you not in his shed? We Well, this was a different <laughs> shed where he, where he had some of his barrels and he had um, he had a barrel that was he was finishing and it was Kalila and Bushmills. And he was finishing it in a PX cask, I think. Um, did that not get released? Was that not one of the Dalriadans? I think one of may, the part one or two. Been. I think, yeah, may have been. Was. Yeah, yeah, it was a Dalriadan. Yeah, so he was like, it, it, that was a great day because I had you know Brian Watts walking me around, uh, excited to show me all the different stuff, and then I had Brendan doing the same thing. I'm like, yeah. I need to visit Ireland more often. <laughs> the energy here is fantastic. Yeah, so. no, it's um, well, look, especially in, as, as we said in the, the whiskey industry, you know, um, just yeah. that sense of, sense of community that I've gotten um, everywhere I go. It's just amazing, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, Irish rum uh, from Killon, uh, Brendan, no better boy than to uh, push the envelope uh, and to uh, experiment, uh, finish in a peated cask. Amazing. Nice. Nice. Was he peating? Was he peating any um, grains while you were up there? Did you see he was, his smoker? He was doing the oats. Yeah, he was exactly. doing the oats, and that was that was flooring me. I'm like, okay, uh, well, and really, I had heard a little bit the day before at Boan about you know what different ingredients, uh, whatever grains that they were using to make pot still whiskey mm. back in the day. Mm. So that was kind of my introduction to it, but it was really interesting. You say I speak with some authority on Irish whiskey. It came from hearing the stories over and over again, but yeah. it took hearing them over and over again for some of the things to really settle in to my mind and go, okay, I'm seeing a commonality here in the way that these things are being presented or in the way that people are distilling, uh, where their passions are at, that sort of thing. So you really do get a sense of the industry, I think, a lot more sometimes just visiting the distillery and taking a tour, but boy, I mean, it now has me regretting that when I went across Kentucky, I didn't talk to distillers the whole time mm -hmm. I was there that yeah. I just, you know, was doing a secret shopper. I'm walking in buying my own ticket and trying to give you an idea in my book of, you know, what I experienced myself while I was there so that you'd know what you would experience when you go this book. I couldn't do that because so many of these distilleries don't have visitors experiences yet. Like Crawley, I show up and they basically are still putting the place together saying, we're yeah. trying to get this done in, in a month so that we can open up and actually let people in and, and see it. So I haven't seen what it looks like completed. Uh, the, what I have seen is are those pot stills and a walkthrough through a lot of dust, getting an idea of what the place is going to end up being like. I, I was there right just after um, Julio Gianna, I think is the head distillery, he's a Brazilian lad. Yeah. Uh, Julio um, had just ripped out all of the old um, brew, brew kit and convinced the three lads to invest <laughs> tens of thousands on a new brewery uh, for him. And uh, he was very, very proud of all the new kit and toys he was after getting. Um, so I, I was there, I think, just just after he um, managed to, to to install all that gear. Yes. Yeah. Nice. yeah. He, I would have liked to have stopped and uh, had a conversation with him. I, we were, I was being led around kind of, and here's the stuff that you should look at, and here's the stuff you should look at. I think it was... Uh, a little protective early on to yeah. uh, kind of get the messaging right before. Maybe just uh, finding their feet, maybe, you know? Yeah, yeah. How so, did you find the reception in Irish distilleries compared to American distilleries? Like, is it more personable? Is it more friendly? Um, do you get more access? Can you get that level of access in American distilleries or maybe in the smaller craft distilleries? Is that kind of similar? Like, what's your kind of um, experience of both? So it's interesting because before I came to Ireland, I was starting to work on a book on Tennessee whiskey. And I relate the Tennessee whiskey experience very, very much like is very much like the Irish experience versus oh. Kentucky and Scotland. Oh, if, right. you go to, if you go to Kentucky, it's polished. Mm -hmm. Every, the, the trail has been there for 23 years now. 
they know what they're doing. The new distilleries coming on board, they fit right into it because it's been developed out and you know what you're going to get. Uh, if you go to Scotland, you get much the same. I mean, if you go from distillery to distillery, they've been doing this for years. They have it down pat and the new distilleries that come in follow that same, not a lot of new distilleries in Scotland, mm -hmm. but um, still visitors experiences being integrated in, they follow a certain pattern. In Tennessee, what I was finding was that many of the places that I was going to, and it's very similar in, in growth. Um, Tennessee only had three distilleries in 2010. They now have over 40 distilleries. So we're talking about in 12 years, they've gone from three to 40. We look at Ireland, we're talking, we went again from 2010 to a couple of distilleries up to where we're at now with 44 44 plus. yeah yeah <laughs> see like you even know the number because most people get that number <laughs> wrong, fair play to you. yeah, yeah. It's 44. so uh, so i compare if you were if you love the irish whiskey experience where it's a little bit more laid back mm. you would like the tennessee experience because the tennessee experience is also very laid back sometimes you will walk into a distillery in tennessee and you just meet the the distiller comes out and says hello to you and says oh i'll show you around you know it's not a formal tour you just yeah. kind of get a chance to chat a little bit or do a tasting um and there are you know situations like that here as well i mean uh, brendan's a great example of that you know how do i write about that in my book it's like uh well he's not a formal tour but you can contact him and he'll probably be happy to show you around. Yeah. And there are, um, you know, Burns, another one that you, you can go out there and uh, you can get the, the history of, uh, of the area basically by just um, showing up and letting, you know, Noel show you his passion for all that he's doing there and that love of, of what, history. What do you think of Noel's project? Um, I think that's one of the most interesting. I, I, um, it's on the bucket list. I mean, I tried to get up there a couple of weeks back, but um, I think he had to go to France or something like that. The stars in the line. Um, but I really, really, really want to get up and see what the burn are doing. I yeah. mean, you know, on paper, if if you were to write out a wish list of of what you wanted in your own distillery, I mean, Noel's kind of living that life. Do you know, I mean, he's he's growing his own grain. He yeah. is malting his own grain. He is distilling his own grain. Um, and then he's putting it in his own oak barrels um, yeah. that he got felled, sent to Galicia, seasoned, coopered, back, sent out for a finishing to just strip that kind of virgin bang off the woods to different um, companies, different distilleries, um, giving them the opportunity to get a virgin oak finish for their whiskeys and then taking it back and maturing his own spirit. I mean... If there's yeah. a blueprint, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I yeah. don't think it's much better than that. Like, you know, I was going to say, well, I'd probably the, like... the more polished version of that would be Eklundville, uh, because yeah, they yeah, really yeah, yeah. want to do everything out of yeah. that look. And I love that. I mean, that's the Springbank uh, yeah. direction of doing uh, things. And that's why people love Springbank, because it you see everything when yeah. you're there, because they do everything there. Um so yeah, there's, it's there's a, more it, of those coming online though. You know, I mean, yeah. um, you know, we've got brands who have got distillery plans and and they've got planning permission in the likes of Morris O'Connell down in in um Lakeview and Killarney. I mean, mm -hmm. in five years' time, we're gonna be talking about Morris in this um uh, same conversation. Uh Richard Tyrone in Coromora State in Waterford. Um mm. he's got a distillery planned. Um, planning permission in and you know he's um, waiting on approval I think at the moment and he's crowdfunding um, or he's he's looking for uh, investors and stuff so like in five years we're going to talk about Richard's project you know in right, the same right. um, Nick Ryan you know with uh, Toman Gate growing his own barley has plans for distillery um, is is uh, you know, trying to get to that place where it, it's it's a viable option for them. There's, there's, I could keep on going. There's, there's, there's loads of people around the country um, yeah. who are really trying to do it authentically. I think that's the word, authentically, you know, um, yeah. and following the likes of the Burren and, as you said, Ecklenville and even Brendan, you know, um, and just trying to do it as authentically as possible. It's it's a, it's, it's fantastic to see as well, you know, people have that passion and they want to do it, you know. Yeah, 
Well, it's I, I know I'm missing they, people here now. I, I'm probably also yeah. we've got like Radham in the state. We're doing as well, David Boyd, uh, yeah. Armstrong, and I, I'm sure I'm leaving out two or three there, lads. I'm sorry. Uh, Connie Kilty, I went uh, yes, there to we go. see them Thank bringing you. back their heritage grain. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, lots of fun experiments. Probably Waterford, the one. God bless us. Water, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the the fun part about Waterford for me was that I had gone to, uh, I had just come back from Jack Daniels and Jack Daniels just re released their American single malt. And I was nervous about it because I had tasted a deconstructed version of it. And it's coming through a column still. And so you're like, well, what's a single malt going to taste like coming out of a column yeah. still? So it was, it was a little flat. And, mm. um, and so I, I mentioned that it was four years in the, in the, uh, bourbon barrel or in, in, in a virgin oak barrel. And, um, you know, and, and Chris said, uh, master distiller said, you know, well, it, it's, it's a grain that needs some help. So it needs some help out of the barrel needs some help out of, and I was like, as a scotch drinker, that, that's really hard to yeah. hear you say. And I said, I feel like it, the limitation is the, um, is what you're running it through. Yes. Now, machine. of course, they make it differently. And this is something that I learned by coming over to Ireland. And after all the distilleries I'd been to in Scotland, I had only realized this when I started uh, flying home that they don't use a coffee still in the US. They use a beer still, which is basically the two parts of the column still stacked on top of each other. And then they use a thumper or doubler to control to make sure they don't get the whiskey over 160 uh, proof. 80% alcohol because uh, the rules of bourbon say it has to be under okay. that. So um, so it's different equipment that they're running it through and they are putting it through a, um, a shaped still of some form when they're doing the thumper slash doubler. And so I had to sort of rethink that and go, okay, I'm going to take that bias out of it. But when I went and sat with Ned in the tasting room at Waterford, and he walked me through all of the, and I said, you know, the thing I didn't really like about Irish whiskey at first was I was getting this solvent kind of note. He said, let me see if I can find a farm that delivers that kind of a note and see if we can de determine what soil might be ca causing that, what kind of subsoil. And we, we nailed it. I was like, that's the, that's the note. And he said, okay. well, that's a, that's a subsoil called kill. And he said that uh, would, would have come from that. And so I thought, well, it's, that's interesting because apparently Middleton um, or Bush Mills or both were getting some of their grain from a farm that was probably delivering that note. And that's why the, those two whiskeys never really raised up in my, my interest. So I went back to Chris and I said, you know, in all of these different uh, barleys, you know, and, and it's amazing the depth of flavor in those. Well, they just released their American single malt. And on my YouTube channel, I did a blind, not a blind taste, a reaction video. <laughs> I was like, and so I thought I'm going to taste this and I'm going to see what it's like. And everybody's going to get my impression. And I spent the first half of the video trying to say, trying to tell people about the, the beer still concept versus the column still, and that we're not distilling quite as high, but it is also, it doesn't have the shape of a pot still. So it may not give us some of those flavors and characteristics that we're expecting. And then I tasted it and I almost fell out of my chair. It was so good. And what made it so good was they aged it for four years in a bourbon barrel and then two more years in an Oloroso sherry cask. Mm. And when I got a chance to talk to him after I tasted it, I said, where did you get those sherry casks from? Because that was the whole thing that made that whiskey. And he said, uh, talk to Alex at Slane and got his distributor where he gets, they're both Brown Foreman. Okay. So he, he talked to Alex at Slane and, uh, he put him in touch with, uh, somebody who had some Oloroso sherry barrels. And I said, pick the winner. And that doesn't surprise me because I got to taste the deconstructed Slane whiskey. And I, I told Alex, I love that sherry, the sherry, the, the sherry version. I wish you would sell that on its own. Yeah. Because that by itself was really, really good. So, um, it's funny you were talking about a thumper there because, um, like this cologne dark rum, it's got thumper keg distilled on the front label there. Okay. Um, but this is the only thumper keg that I've ever seen being used in 
the world of Irish whiskey and lots of rum. But you've been yeah. using your, like, you know, Brendan's the only person kind of um, experimenting with Humber, from my knowledge in Ireland. There is um, another distillery that will have oh, one. Well, I don't know if it's a, I, it's not a thumper. It'll be a doubler. Okay. Uh, but Church of Oak. Okay. All right. Yeah. So they okay, are. Okay, Monster Evan. Yeah. So that mm-hmm. will be very interesting to see what they do over there. That's um, interesting. Yeah. They're yeah. heavily investing. Sorry, my dog there is uh, sniffing on place. Get out of there. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so you can hear <laughs> sniffling in the corner. People are wondering what's going on there. <laughs> um. Yeah, did you did you stop by Church of Oak? Were you able to get in I the did. gates? Did you? Fair play. What What was amazing about that? I can't tell a lot about it because they kind of are like, "We'll let you in, but we can't," you know, kind of keep it on the down low at the moment. Yes. But um, when I was in, it was May, and some as I'm doing this trip, I keep bumping into other distilleries that weren't on my list. So like when I was up at McConnell's, uh, Sarah up there was telling me, oh, Limavati. I'm like, I didn't even know. Uh, mm-hmm. Titanic. Oh, I didn't even know. Glens of Antrim. Okay, now I'm now I'm yeah. second. I'm, I'm looking at my list going, how inadequate this list is for what is coming. And um, then I, as I was looking ahead, it was at ha- Hasgra that they had a map mm-hmm. of distilleries and somehow church of oak was on that Mm. map of distilleries and i was like oh that's interesting i'll have to go figure out what that is they had just gotten on social media and so i sent them a message through social media and said this is what i'm doing i'm writing a book about irish whiskey would you mind if i stop in and so i got a chance to go in and they walked me around and yes it was massively under construction at the moment but i was there as they were running their first um first run of whiskey so you're lucky because i reached out as well when um when it started when the project started because i wanted to get in there and see it before it was completed and uh geez i got a stone wall so you Mm. you did much better than i did (laughs) you must have a lot more pull than i do um, maybe or american coming over (laughs) saying i got a book you know it's the thing i've found uh since i've written the book that people's ears perk up a little bit more you say you're a podcaster they're like okay and then you say Mm. and i wrote a book and they go oh come on over (laughs) so how how have you found the podcasting world? Let's talk about a shop at the moment. I want to okay. ask you that question. Um, so this is what you're you've got three different podcasts that you've kind of uh, started the travel one and the two whiskey ones. Yeah, so I did the travel one up until I realized that my love was in whiskey travel, <laughs> not in just yeah. general travel. Um, so that one is kind of died on the it's it's out there for people to listen to when I when I record episodes. I try to do stuff that I call evergreen. That's going to be relevant three years from now, five years from now. Uh, you're breaking my heart with that bottle, by the way. Uh, it's my favorite. <laughs> this that's is a my special favorite. bottle. Yeah, my favorite. This is a special one. So yeah. far, has come from Dunville's. So really, so yes, what, but it hasn't come from Dunville's. Well, yeah, it came from Cooley, yeah, but from Cooley. still, <laughs> what they've what they've done, what they do Cooley. with it. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. It, that's a special transformation isn't it uh, yeah. what they manage to because there's so many people in my opinion um get coolie very wrong oh my god very wrong dunville's oh my god uh Jarlis and graham and the lads i know graham's after leaving uh, or he's in the process of moving on um uh, the head stiller but uh, what they've done up there is amazing um and this uh, this is a 20 year old cask 1717. This has been my favorite to date. 1717. Oh, you have it there, a little sample. Well, yeah. uh, this is this is the 18 uh oh, right. 18 year old 994. Yeah. So uh <laughs> it's this empty one, as you can tell. 1717 as you can see, I've had this for around a year and I've been nursing it. So yeah. I'm just pouring it a wee little drop just to, just to tease myself <laughs> since we were talking northern the still there a while ago. But um, yeah, yeah, Amazing. no, I love I just love a wee that drop, still. just a touch. I mean, yeah, we'll try and eke it out for another six months. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, podcasting. How have you found it? It's um, it's it's a it's a busy busy old market, isn't it? 
It is. Um, and what's interesting is that back when I was traveling a lot and getting on planes and doing a lot of road trips, I was listening to a lot of podcasts. Yeah. But but what's happened since then is I'm always working and I never can. It's always thought work. So it's like I can't just have a podcast on somewhere and listen to it. And I feel like I'm missing a lot. Yeah. But also kind of coming from an audio engineer background, um, the quality of podcasts drives me nuts because it's sometimes I will hear a podcast and I'm like, I would love to hear more of this, but the either the yes. audio quality is so bad or the people are just kind of after a while, there's they're not talking about anything. They're just kind of sitting there making jokes back and forth. And it's like, I want to learn something when I, I got a time goal. I, I think, I think it's a time goal. It's like, you know, their, their episodes, they're 40 minutes long. They're, they're an hour long. It's, you know, they're, they're just getting to that time goal. Whereas I didn't really care going into this. If our chat was going to be 20 minutes or three hours, I don't care. It's yeah. whenever it ends, it ends. We'll know when it ends, you know, it's a natural conversation. You can, I am looking at you. We can read each other's body language. We know where the natural conclusion has come. And, um, that's what I find most interesting. Just you know, and and one that's what a podcast should be. I think it should be an eaves, eavesdrop into people's thoughts and conversations. You know, and nice. and who doesn't like just sitting there, people watching and listening in or whatever. You know, and I think that's what it is. It's a small little bit of that. You know, voyeurism. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely agree. Well, what's funny is it took me a while. If you look at my travel fuels life, those were sixty minute episodes. Always sixty minutes. I always cut off the conversation at sixty minutes. And then when I started doing this podcast, really the interviews podcast, the idea was, okay, well, you know, I'm doing all these interviews for my stories podcast. I should just release the interviews, even though they're raw, because I really like people need to hear some of this other information. And then I, think, start- I told you that from the start. I think they're the best. They're, uh, they're the ones that, that draw me in, you know, the, the kind of natural conversation you learn from people, you know, and, yeah. and that that was my goal starting the podcast. It was how do I educate myself the fastest and talk to the best people that I will learn from? Yeah, let's have a conversation. Let's record it. And, you know, hopefully it can attract uh, the most interesting people. And um, I think I've done uh, quite well in, in, yeah. in talking to really, really great guests. Oh, my God. Amazing people like amazing. Yeah. Well, and then you get to the the thing is, is if you try to hold it to 40 minutes or 60 minutes, you shorten up your questions and you cut people off because you're trying to get to the next piece. And what I find is that the more I chat with people, the more, you know, things get unveiled that I know nobody else is talking about there. These guys have probably been interviewed, you know, 25 times on podcasts and they've heard the same questions over and over and over again how can we get to something that might yeah. be more interesting or that uh, will open them up? I, I used to have a goal with the travel podcast where I would research the person and I would find something uh, out about them that I know nobody had asked them about that was personal uh, in a way to get them to kind of open up or to throw them off track. And you would get particular guests who you could tell they were scripted. They, they, they had the marketing message and they were going to blurt out the marketing message. No offense to brand ambassadors. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so my Fair goal enough. was always to, to catch them on something where they'd go, whoa, I didn't expect that because then the whole tone of the conversation changes and suddenly they start to loosen up and suddenly you can start really getting beyond the brand message, which is sometimes a little bit too stiff and yeah. If everybody's heard it already, really, what am I adding to the podcast world by just getting somebody to say the same things that somebody said on another podcast? Yeah. So, you know, I think that's, it took me a while to get comfortable with it, but I, I remember I was never somebody who watched Joe Rogan, but for some reason he had a guest on, I wanted to watch and the conversation went on for two and a half hours and I watched on video the whole two and a half hours and I didn't want it to end. And that's when I said, you need to just let loose and go. <laughs> you learned the exact same lesson that I learned. Um, it was from uh, the Joe Rogan experience. I went, 
oh, that's how it's done. All oh, right, you just let a conversation go where it goes, and um, it is what it is, and you don't try and contrive it. Um, I did used to kind of sit down and we'll say create twenty questions, you know, do loads of research and and hours of this. No, I mean, you know, if someone's been on a podcast before, like, you know, for the past, we, we discussed this two weeks ago, having a chat. So for the past um, couple of weeks, I've been re-listening back to some of the interviews and stuff and just getting my head into um into in, into Drew mode, you know, and just yeah. kind of, you know, that's what I that's what I do. But I didn't know what we were going to talk about, you know. Um, I just had an idea and uh, uh, I think that's uh, the most fun, I believe, anyway, you know. But yeah. let's stop talking shop now because the lads are getting all bored and turning off. <laughs> um, so you were up north and 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 you were up in the uh, northeast. Yep. You went across into Crawley. Yeah. I bet you didn't skip Boylock Distillery. I did not skip it. Now, nope. is not another little special gem. That's fun. Uh, yeah. Just like just like Brendan's gaff. Yeah. Um, that's another little special gem. Isn't so it? it's what Mike what Michael's got going on. So this is uh this this is what's funny is that while we were sitting there talking about whiskey he said something about trying to do grains on that he really respects american distillers and he's kind of interested in doing grains on distilling and so we got into this whole conversation and i'm like you know i really don't know enough about it to tell you because most distillers that i know in the u.s that do grains on are doing it in the column still so i'm not sure how you handle it in a pot still and he said i don't know that you can actually do it and i when said you say well, grains on you mean grains uh, you don't filter the grains out of the yeah you're not distilling the wort you're distilling yeah. it all you're just throwing yeah. it all in and so and the and, See, the, and the problem with that is that you're creating an insulation bed so it takes far more energy to get that heat to boil that um um uh, liquid you know yeah um it's much more difficult and expensive and you know you can risk burning it as well if you if you right. um you know what i mean the so you can you risk an off notes and ah uh, when in Tennessee, I kept hearing people who had moonshine experience talking about scorched whiskey. And mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean by scorched whiskey? And they said, well, the grains burn. And if, it, if the yeah. grains burn well in that, in that pot still, uh, you can't get rid of that, that taste. And it's, uh, it takes the whole thing over. So it was funny because I went down and I was at uh, a draw and, and chatting about uh, distilling. And they said, we're doing on grain. And I went, oh, I got somebody you need to talk to. <laughs> because <laughs> you're doing exactly what he's wanting to do up there and so it was it's fun it felt like i was kind of the little messenger going through and uh you know here's what i learned somewhere I, I think the thing that got me too was that there were a lot of distilleries i went to well not a lot but there were there were a few distilleries i went to that said you know most people around the country aren't distilling they're bringing in sourced liquid and they, they were talking about them like they didn't have pot stills. And mm -hmm. I said, no, every place I've gone to has pot stills and they mm -hmm. are all making whiskey. It is just that, you know, they're it's a young right industry. Now. Yeah. Yeah. They have to source. And that's, that's just, again, with Tennessee, a lot of distilleries are using MGP uh, whiskey out of Indiana because MGP is like great Northern. It, they basically are supplier okay. to the, yeah, to the, the country. Engine. Yeah. engine to the industry and, and that's really what they are you know um yeah. which coolie were for a long time what yeah. um what did you th what did you make of his uh potching um he let me taste the peated one which was a, a lot of fun so yeah i enjoyed uh i enjoyed those i um there were certain bottles like i, I was all his potching is peated am i right in saying that? is it okay okay um I'm... i can't think of an unpeated version of his potching Okay. You no, know, it's all that people. that could nice. be. I have a bottle here. Um, this is the peat and port. Uh, so it's okay. It says Donegal peat. Yeah. I must uh I must ring him up actually and give out to him. He shouldn't. He didn't say Donegal turf, but um, <laughs> uh, this is, uh, uh, well, he's the peat and port Mul Mulroy Bay. Yeah. Well, he he took me over to where he was uh where he was uh, smoking his barley as well. So that yeah. was uh that was a treat to get to see that as well. Yeah, it's a very unusual spirit he's producing, you know. Um, yeah, it's yeah. so different. Um, it's kind of ashy smoke. Um, but uh, well, he was one of the few places I saw that had a hybrid still, which is not something that you tend to. Um, the only other place I saw, I guess they called it a Loman still at the uh, at Church of Oak, but um, 
you know, no, Pierce Lines also have a Vendome still. Um, I think that's right. That's right. Four or five I always, plates. I yeah. always forget. Yeah, I always forget about that. It's an interesting yeah. trade off there because if you go to the Pierce Lyons Distillery, which is uh, Town Branch in oh, Town uh, Branch, Lexington, yes, yes, they ha- they have uh, Forsyth pot stills there. Yeah, yeah. So it's just like yeah, yeah, trading yeah. culture. It's really cool. And Town Branch also have um, the oldest single malt. American single malt. Yes. Um, they don't. Um, I don't yep. think it's released yet. I think it's about to be released. No, they like eight or nine years old. Is it? Have they released it? Um, they they have uh, they've had a single malt out for a long time. Have they? Okay, sorry. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm misremembering. I thought yeah. I thought they were keeping onto it for a while. Yeah. No, it's um, uh, the thing is, is that they use that it's a brewery as well. Yeah. So they uh, they made they were one of the first to do a bourbon aged beer and they would just basically reuse the, the barrels for that. Then they would bring the barrels back after they made the beer in them and use them for aging the, uh, um, American single malt. So they, they started and they weren't the first American single malt. The first American single malt is, uh, I think it's the oldest American single malt. Uh, Am I right in saying that? McCarthy's is in Oregon goes back to nice. 19, 1985. Okay. We'll and have to have a chat it? to Connor Ryan there because Connor Connor was feeding me Connor was feeding me uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh it's interesting because I've interviewed uh Joe uh O'Sullivan from there as well. And that started out as basically it's all the Irish names are in there, you're saying. Yes, mm. yes. So he um the, the the man that started it was on a trip in Ireland and fell in love with peated scotch, which mm. seems like an interesting, yeah, but yeah. he would, in 1985, there wasn't a lot of no. Irish whiskey. Jameson there was certainly probably, was no peated whatsoever. Like yeah. that wasn't an option. Yeah. So uh, interesting because they still make peated uh, Oregon single malt out there. Oh, very good. Class. So, yeah. In fact, they okay. just released their first PX cask, I think, uh, with their peated so and that's all they do is peated yeah that's yeah. interesting yeah and that's and that, is that mccarthy's distillery you said is it mccarthy's yeah oh must yeah. go for that is this one of these um distilleries that don't see past the state lines no they uh they do ship uh, across the country in fact uh I, you probably know ralphie the mm-hmm. youtuber he yeah. actually uh, a few years back did a review of it and he's like okay. wow this is actually really good I look and it there. is, yeah. Um, it's, Ralphie's uh, graced me with his presence twice in the podcast. Um, has he? Okay. Good, good old chats, yeah. Ralphie's, yeah. Uh, I like Ralphie. He's, uh, I've, I follow his Patreon channel. If anyone, like I keep on saying it to anyone who, um, you should really sign up to his Patreon channel for a few quid a month. Um, the extra content and the education I've gotten from that man is, oh yeah, you know, nobody's business is brilliant. Um, the Patreon yeah. channel he has is amazing. Um, I highly, highly recommend anyone to sign up to it. That's nice. I've uh, I talked to a couple of Canadian podcasters who interviewed him, and they said, "You just ask a question and then just sit back and let him go." <laughs> Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. I I got a kind of uh, I time a rant out, like roughly. Yeah. All, all you do is it's like a catapult. You know, you just you just kind of um, pull pull pull. Just release fifteen minutes. Yeah. Um, just shut up. Just sit back and just drink. Sip sip What's... your whiskey and enjoy it. What's great about him is that you can go back and still watch his old videos and you see his progression over time and kitchen. you see how he was like in the, like in the kitchen. kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and he's just doing really short videos. And then all of a sudden they just started getting longer and longer. And then he had to split into doing the extras because he had so much con. I think people were complaining that wanted to just get to the tasting. It's like, uh, Hey, you know, talk about the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so yeah, very interesting guy um um a true passionate whiskey fan and um yeah. uh, i'm doing uh, you know all these kind of barrel experimentations and all that kind of thing that he's like i, I kind of do myself out in the workshop and and see what he can make with this and how that tastes and what happens if you do this and um love love kind of discovering and innovating and uh learning you know about all the kind of uh different um aspects of of the spirit you know did you tell him he needs to start uh dipping into a little irish whiskey because i know he's he used to do bourbon and he used to do rye and i hear him talk about those and when he does i sense that he needs to start tasting those again because his his education outside of scotland is waning a bit 
I'd, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to sit Ralphie down for a night and just um, crack a few bottles with him and go, all right, dude, pull up yeah. a seat. Um, <laughs> here's what you're missing. Um, yeah. Here's what you're missing. I think it's, uh, I think it is a narrow focus um, and I, I'd love to sit him down and just show him all the new stuff. I mean, even just what I have in the back shelf there, like, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a who's who of, of, of innovators and, and, and fun distilleries, you know, um, and I bet you most people have only heard of half of them, you know, so yeah. um, there's some yeah. really, really cool stuff, as you discovered um, on your little trip around, you know. Absolutely. And we've only gotten to Northern Ireland so far. Yes. So when you went down <laughs> west, um, yes. did you, so which, which what route did you take after Crawley, which, or after Ardra, as we'll say? What the, I then went to Ardra, and then I went to uh, uh, Sligo, so I went to um uh I went to Aru and then I went to um Shed and then I came back up to Connick and then Akal Island and then Lo uh Lockery and um well actually uh Loch Mask first and then Lockery and then to Ahaskra and then Mickle and then Burren. It's amazing. I can remember. That's a great, you're <laughs> doing a zigzag. I am. As you yeah. are like the, yeah. um, what, what, um, oh God, you just overloaded me. <laughs> so, so many questions. Um, uh, uh, drum shambo. What do you think of the shed distillery? Um, I'm actually going to pour a drop because I actually have. Okay. Nice. Of their pot still, uh, from drum shambo. Very um, nice. I love amazing the whiskey. bottle actually. The bottle is amazing. Like the detail yeah. and the, like the cost, the money they've after putting into this bottle, like with a brass ring around the cork and that kind of uh, coin on embossed into the bottle, a metal yeah. coin, um, and the the embossed look. It's an amazing bottle. I mean, it really, really is like the detail. Every time you look at it, you spot a new little um kind of squeaky cork as well, which is um nice. all better. Mm. Gotta like that, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I um I actually visited uh the shed distillery in Drum Shambo by Barge. Oh, okay. So, yeah, myself and the family rented a uh, riverboat and I um, boated up to Jum Shambo, parked up and walked up to the distillery. It was class. Very <laughs> it was nice. Brilliant. It was class. Yeah. Um, and the canal up to, I, I like, I was shitting it. It was one, it was a really, really old canal, kind of off the, the main canal, off the yeah. main river, off the Shannon. And um, it's it was like a, a one a single a single lane kind of uh river so like the side of the boat was scraping you know the banks is like if i'd met another boat on the way back down i would know what was going to happen because i mean <laughs> i'd have to go out and pull it backwards or something but like it yeah. was really really cool it was a lovely experience you know something i'll never kind of um forget myself and my small fella um he was 14 at the time so we we took the the trip the jaunt up um the two of wow. us in the boat to jump shamba was class yeah it was really cool I, I really, uh, to, to me, that distillery is about, um, it, for me, it, it is very, um, theatrical almost, mm. uh, when you go in, it is a very well thought out, um, planned tour. Sorry. My phone is I have an alarm for some reason. <laughs> there we go. Uh, sorry about that. But, um, yeah, it was like, uh, like dogs snuffling in the corner there. there you go. <laughs> Something happened at three forty-five on some Thursday. Um, <laughs> so I had, um, walked in there and, uh, it's, uh, it's just really nicely laid out. It's a very polished distillery. It's probably the mm. most polished distillery I walked yeah. into. And then it's like I say, it's almost theatrical when you walk in and you go through this whole big presentation and then you see the pot stills for about five minutes and then you're into the world of gin. And the so curious mind, the curious mind, the and curious so mind the, of PJ Rigney. Yes. Yeah. So the, so for the whiskey fan, I was like, Oh man, I would love to actually probably spend a little more time around the pot stills, but yeah. I don't think that's necessarily the audience that they're looking for. The person who's really wanting to dive in deep into process and, yeah. uh, and the rest. And, and that's I, great. I think they they've been so story. successful with gin yeah. that I think that maybe they attract more of the gin crowd than the whiskey crowd. That's just the feeling I get. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the tour might be a bit more geared towards um, that demographic um, rather than the, the whiskey nerd, we'll say, you know. Um, yeah. It might be nice, though, if they had even um, you could go on a gin tour or you could do a whiskey tour. That yeah. might be a nice idea, you know, um, yeah. and, and cater to both communities, you know. Um, 
I, I think so. But I know yeah. I, 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 I had the same feeling when I was up there with yourself, you know, it was a bit, uh, I would have preferred less of the theatrics and more of the, um, you know, hugging the stills and yeah. smelling the mash ton. And- <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, uh, to my credit or to, to their credit, after I got uh, through with the tour and was in the tasting room, they said, do you want to go back and see the stills? I said, yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. So yeah, uh, I got a second look, but I get they told it. Me, they told me I couldn't take pictures of the still. So um, yeah. I think I've got like a 12 minute video of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're told not to do something. It's like, you I'm, figure I'm out how. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, This pot still is really good, actually. Um, mm-hmm. I haven't gone back to it in a couple of months. It's really good. So this is the thing. I have a bottle of the powers uh three swallow mm. now i bought this specifically i could have gotten the john's lane but i said i i am a fan of the pot stills that i tasted while i was over there and there's nothing over here that i can relate to them to me red breast pot still to me is like um peated whiskey or um or rye whiskey if you really like the character of the grain the longer it's in the barrel, the less you're getting the mm, character you yes. want. Yes. And so I'm going, I got to find, I don't want a 12 year John's Lane. I hear it's fantastic. And someday I will get a bottle. It is. It is. But I wanted something that was younger. What's interesting about this uh, Three Swallow is that um, when I first tasted it, like on the finish, it had this weird note when I, I was like, it's like Paps Blue Ribbon beer. It's like, it's, it's almost like a burnt grain note that comes in at the end. And I was like, I'm not sure if I'm really digging that. And I got on the phone. I was talking with my brother. We hadn't talked for a long time. And we were in uh, this big, long conversation. And I just kept pouring a little more, a little more, a little more until half the bottle was gone. And I was like, okay, this stuff is dangerous. Because <laughs> it does, it has, uh, it, it, it's not as oily as some of the pot still whiskey that i had over there it's a lighter it's, style yeah for, yeah for sure but it's still good it's mm. still it's like you can for somebody who can't get that style over here it's as close as i've been able to get to it at this point so and that's why every time i talk to somebody in ireland i'm like God, you guys are so lucky because you can actually go get something i have to sit here and wait till our uh distributors finally figure out what pot still to bring over here Ours has long been the uh, hidden kind of hidden secret in, because it didn't really, you know, it wasn't really available outside the shores, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And traditionally, you know, you were either um, a Jimson family, you were a Powers family or a Bushmills family. And mm-hmm. there wasn't that many Bushmills family down south. There just, there just wasn't tr- traditionally and politically. Um, and it was usually you were a Jameson or a Powers family, you know. Um, so all the old fellas would have their point a plane and a drop um and the drop is usually a powers uh, mm. but i I'm, I'm i'm with you on that I, I like distillate for i like tasting the spirit i like distillate for whiskies there are some cask bombs that are amazing i mean lockery for one are knocking it out of the park with their bonding mm. um celtic casks are, can be amazing as well you know but they're kind of cask bombs um but i do if I had a choice, I would go yeah. for a distillate forward whiskey for sure. I want yeah. to know what's going on there. I, I don't want to cover it up or, or adulterate it. I want to I want to understand the process. And and I think you can uh, with an experienced palate, you can dissect the process from the distillate. You know, you can, you can, you can, you can ascertain certain things that went on, you know, and you can call them, you know, with experience. Um yeah. and I like to do that. That's what challenges me. That's what interests me with 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 spirits um and especially Irish whiskey. Um but you know powers, I think you're going to see a lot more powers in America uh very, very soon. I think and I feel like there's going to be a huge US push on powers. Mm. Um they've been kind of um They've been flying the flag there for a while, you know, um, and I think the future 100% rye whiskey uh, yeah. from Powers, that's going to be hitting the shelves. Um, I think it got, I sure look, 
us Irish were murderer for checking out the TTB because we always get the you know the, the up on, on all the companies. But yeah. I think yeah, I think they got that got released there a couple of months back. Um, so that rye whiskey, I mean, that says to me all you need to know. They're really, I think, going to lean heavily into the US market with the Powers brand uh, very very, very soon. Nice. You know, so hopefully yeah. you'll see the John's Lane all over the shop. Okay. So and here here's here's my one tip, and I, I got it off Fanon O'Connor years ago. He said, when you drink Powers, yeah, John's Lane, don't sip it. Take a mouthful. Take a mouthful and just okay. You know, just wash it around. Like that's yeah. that's that's where the uh power that that's 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 where John's Lane comes to life. You know, it's the mouthfeel and the viscosity and the oils and and just enjoy that sensation. You know, mm-hmm. and, and just 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 feel it and 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 leave it leave it wash over. So yeah, that's my one. Whenever whenever someone sees someone tra- takes John Lane, I I I I, I take Fanon's cue and I say take a mouthful. Don't sip it. Take a mouthful. <laughs> so you know, a measure a measure is two gulps. That's that's, yeah. that's the best way I feel to. Um, and I agree with him. Like so, I think that's the best way to to drink uh, John's Lane. It's interesting that you say that because um, I had a friend of mine shows you what kind of friend he was. Uh, or is he he gave me two bottles mini bottles of whiskey for my birthday and one was a whistle pig 10 rye uh, and the other was a, a johnny walker blue and he said now i don't like either of these whiskeys but can you tell me <laughs> what you know if you what you think of them tell me your opinion on them so i tasted the whistle pig and i'm like eh, i'm not a really big fan of it because it's a 10 year old rye it's too long in the barrel for me so okay. Uh, that was part of my issue with it, but uh, I'm sorry, I, whistle pig. Educate me. Is that Kentucky? Is that like that's the, uh, Vermont? Actually, Vermont. And, okay, uh, so it's they, not a tropical maturation. It's a slow no. maturation. Yeah, oh, and right. they do this. Uh, actually, I don't know where they get their liquid from. The uh, Limavade is actually um, distributed by whist- whistle pig. So okay. yeah, um, I, I hate to say I'm not as well versed on whistle pig just because I I've had that 10 and it's like, I just have kind of dismissed them after that. Not to say I, they don't make good stuff, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I was like, uh, um, I've, I've, I've derailed actually on where I was going with that. Um, was it big distillus? Yeah. Uh, and we were talking about, um, we were just talking about John's Lane and the viscosity and the mouthfeel. Sometimes you just run off the rails and it'll come back to me in a few minutes. I'm sure. We'll jump back. (laughs) We'll jump back in a second. Yeah. I'm going to pour another last drop. Um, And I'm going to save the last drop for a cork whiskey. And um, I know you visited the Jameson distillery. So this is the Jameson 12 distillery edition. Now you probably will not see this. Because yeah. this kind of stopped being sold maybe three years ago, and that was the end of it. The, the uh, taps were turned off, yes. But this is yeah. a fantastic drop. The Distillery Edition 12 year old Jameson. Amazing okay. drop. Uh, lovely pot still. Uh, sorry, blend. Um, um, I, I I may have one or two of these stashed for for future consumption. Um, but I think they'll they'll stay away in the back of the cupboard for a while yet. <laughs> but I'm gonna pour one small little drop. Um. Because you might as well finish with my local distillery, Middleton. Yeah, yeah. So what was interesting was when I got down to the south, the only pub I really stopped in on the entire trip was in Skibbereen. And I had to go to the one, I had to go to the one town where I couldn't understand anybody. (laughs) (laughs) And I was in the pub and there was hurling championships going on. And I was, I was enthralled with the hurling championship, but. Oh, early summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I just couldn't really uh, understand. The, the the guy next to me was uh, talking to me. We we're having a nice conversation, I think, because some of the stuff I heard coming out of his mouth, I understood. But it's like, I love when I go to Scotland, I go to Glasgow. And I always do all my trips out of Glasgow. But Glaswegian accents, boy, when they lay it on thick, forget it. You just, I mean, American ears, it doesn't matter. In fact, I've talked to people who've said, that that live in Scotland, they're like, I don't know what they're saying either. <laughs> so you know what uh, I thought was funny. Um on Whiskey Cast this week, um, Mark had Jarlett Watson from Ecklenville, and uh, Jarlett has the thickest, thickest, thickest uh Northern Ireland accent you will ever hear of anyone. <laughs> like I can barely understand them half the time. 
Um, yeah. And I'm surprised they didn't have subtitles because <laughs> I was I was listening to kind of going because I have my ear tuned to Jarlett these days. Well, I've tuned 98 percent. And I was thinking there is people listening to this and they haven't a balls notion what this man is saying. Like <laughs> he's, uh, he's got the most fantastic, thick, deep, yeah. um, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> got to relax and is brilliant. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, West Cork is uh, in the same vein as well. It's like so, some people down there kind of. um they talk like their mouth is full. It's all very old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was a challenge. So I, I knocked back a few beers and that made it a little easier. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, a, a funny thing about Jarlath was when I showed up, um, he had investigated me a bit before I showed up and uh, saw my Travel Fuels Life uh, podcast and saw that I had done a trip across Europe going to uh, all the James Bond locations that mm. I could get to. So we spent the first probably 20 minutes I was there just talking about James Bond. <laughs> That's cool. So, yeah. A lot of no, fun. He's, he, he's a good um he's a good companion to have. Uh, I also have fun around Gerald to be honest with you. Yeah. Um when you were in Skibreen is it you were in West Cork distillery is that what you were visiting? Yeah. Yeah. And uh Actually, I had Dennis show me around, which oh, uh, did you? because yeah, Jesus, you're privileged. Yeah, exactly. You're getting all the access. So like, I, <laughs> you, need, you, need to, you need to show me the tricks here, buddy. Uh, yeah, exactly. So that was uh, fun. Th I mean, those was... lads, those lads don't really, um, they don't really want to connect um, with the whiskey community as much, you know. Um, so you were you were very lucky to have, have Dennis, one of the founders and owners. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh... We'll have to compare notes then and see all the places I got into that I snuck in. The only places That's I couldn't cool. get, the only place I couldn't get into, uh, and I ended up doing uh, a regular standard tour. Uh, well, short cross, I didn't get to, uh, uh, I bought a ticket there and I bought a ticket at, um, uh, oh, at Rowan Co. Um, and so, that's uh, which was fine. It was uh, it was good to do the regular tour, and uh, in fact, in a way, it was relaxing because you feel like you go into a distillery, you got lots of questions to ask, and they aren't really in a mode You're of anonymous. giving you all the detail. Yeah, so mm -hmm. uh, it was a chance to just kind of experience a tour and and go through it. But I, I will say that the the challenge for me was the clock because in some cases I'd have three distilleries in a day and I was just okay. really getting into a conversation and it's like, ah, oh, I got to go. <laughs> and that's when hard. You, when you came to Middleton, did you do the regular tour or did you get the uh, special Drew tour? I did the behind the scenes uh, pay for tour. Yes. So, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's good though, isn't it? It is good. It is good. Yeah. Uh, a lot on the cooperage, which was kind of uh, interesting way to go. And then getting a chance to taste some whiskey back in the, uh, I guess they call it the archives or the distillery manager's house. Is that what it is? Yeah. The archives. That's um, yeah. The old distillers cottage. Yeah. It's where um, it was the old Crockett family home, essentially uh, Okay, where Barry was born, Barry Crockett, ex master distiller and his father, Max Crockett as well, that he was the master still before him. And yeah, he grew up there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool. It would have been fun to see the new distillery. You know, I, I know it's probably uh, very industrial, but mm. still it would be, I mean, Great Northern is somewhat industrial as well, but mm. still there's fascinating things to see there. And, uh, um, and that's where the stuff is coming out of. Yeah. I, I hate to say it. I actually ended up showing up. I was so enthralled with what was going on at Waterford that I didn't really pay attention to the clock. And it was like, oh, I got to get going because I have to be down to Middleton for my next tour. And I thought the tour started at 3.30 and it started at 2.30. So I showed up late. So I they were just starting to taste the red breast when I was there and they had already talked about method and madness and I missed all of that sort of stuff. Well, you so, missed the trip through the micro distillery as well. So I joined it right as they were getting finished with that part of the mm. tour. So yeah, that was a little disappointing that I didn't get to, to do all of that, but, um, 
But I my my favorite my favorite bit about the micro distillery is the gin still, um, Mickey's belly they call it off after an old uh, distillery worker you know who who had a rather partly shape and they 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 used to call it uh, they they because it's kind of a r- round bulbous um uh, still. Um, so they christened it Mickey's Belly uh, many, many moons ago, but that still originally came from Watercourse Road. And to anyone from Cork City, that's down um, where Blackpool in, in Blackpool, um, which is the uh, kind of an old part of the north side, um, mm. where the river runs down through it. And there was um, uh, the Greens Distillery and Watercourse Road Distillery, and, and, and it was very close by, was um. Uh, or Wise's Distillery, North Mal Distillery. Um, so, you know there, there, there was real old distilling history there, but but that Mickey's Belly Gin Still in the Micro Distillery that came yeah. from the old Watercourse Road Distillery. You know, oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, Silent Distillery. You know, like you know, not there anymore. Like all, all like all that's left is the the mall things, which is about to be turned into apartments, kind of up over the the North Ring Road around the city. Um, and there's like Distillery Court. I think is like some little courtyard of of terrace housing you know um but that's the only kind of that's all that's left in in blackpool you know of um oh there's a bar that's closed down 10 years called the distillery <laughs> but that's it like you know you would know there's nice. you wouldn't know there was three or four distilleries you know within spitting distance of each other but yeah. that like that's special i think that um uh, the method of madness gin you know then a lovely cobalt blue bottle um and that all comes from this still mickey's belly that used to uh, run in Watercourse Road, you know, okay. like long forgotten road. So, you know, it's small little details like that, I think, is special. And that's why if I'm in a bar I, and I see Method of Madness gin, I'm drinking Method of Madness mm. gin, you know, just because of that kind of, not to mention the fact that it's one of the best gins out there. But anyway, yeah. um, that legacy, and I know where it came from. And that's, you're drinking this this little nugget of history, you know, that, 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 you know, um, it, it's gone. Like it's, there's no footprint left, you know, it's, it's such a shame. Um, but those cool little, those cool little nuggets that you find in Middleton are just amazing, you know? Yeah. I'll have yeah. to go back and do it again. I think what's fun about doing the podcast and doing the research on Irish whiskey history is as I am doing this history research, it's going to be fun coming back to Ireland and, not only seeing how the industry is evolving and all these distilleries I saw when they were first opening up and what they are ending up turning out to be, uh, but also having more of a connection with the history of Irish whiskey, because I, it's a fascinating history. And um, it's just, we over here know mm, a little bit, <laughs> but not enough to, uh, in fact, most of what we know about it is probably more tied in with how it relates to scotch rather than how it yeah. ties into irish whiskey itself i think if you ask most people over here you know um about irish whiskey in the 1960s where was irish whiskey in the 1960s they'd be like we have no idea they wouldn't yeah. know that there was just one company in fact i found it was really interesting as i was doing the history to realize that if it hadn't have been for john teeling the whole Irish whiskey industry would have been owned by the French. Yeah. I mean, that's uh fascinating and scary all at the same time. And we wouldn't have an industry only for the French, um, call a spade a spade. I mean, they they kept the fires a burning when yeah. no one really no one else wanted to, you know, no one else saw the potential or um um yeah, the potential of Irish whiskey. And look where we are today and uh 44 distilleries later, do you know what I mean? was the french in 1988 that saved our bacon you know yeah yeah well and how many <laughs> um, people through the island that i i talked to that would uh such respect for what they did with jameson and that they yes, they yes. talk about jameson in a very positive manner you would think you know i think of the united states and i think a brewer trying to go up against budweiser you know they're not always going to have the kindest things to say but in this particular case, it's like, here is a whiskey that really kept the name Irish whiskey in existence for the world. And it kept it at the forefront and it kept this on people's, it kept it in people's mouths, you know, um, yeah. only for it, people wouldn't be saying the word Irish whiskey, you know? Yeah. Um, but you know, if you, if you are making a trip back, um, um, two grace periods, 
um, to come to Ireland would be March and May. There's mm. two new whiskey festivals happening in March. One at the start of March, the okay. Southeast Whiskey Festival in Wexford. Um, that's going to be Cracker. Um, and then uh, we've got the Cork Whiskey Festival, Cork Whiskey Fest in Cork on the 24th, 25th and 26th of March. So March is a good year to visit if, if you're thinking about coming. Um, between those two festivals, there is fantastic uh, events happening and then in May we've then got um, uh, Whiskey Live Dublin as well you know yeah so like you know lining up if your trip to to kind of coincide <laughs> with one of the three of them there you go yeah. down to a winner I have to just keep coming back then I got Belfast Whiskey Week on top oh of that oh my god so. Belfast and all Jesus I forgot about he'll kill, he'll, he'll, he'll kill me he'll kill me um. yeah <laughs> no I had a fun, I had a fun time when I was in Belfast because it was my birthday and um, and after I did, I did Hinch and then I went to, uh, uh, to short cross. And then I went up to, uh, Belfast and I went to the Duke of York Yes, and, um, okay. yeah, they were doing the McConnell's sherry, uh, whiskey release. And so I was, uh, I was there for that. And then they're like, Oh, we're doing the Belfast whiskey club up in Duke of York. You can come up if nice. you want to. Yeah. Man, that was all. And then uh, Brendan showed up in the middle of that, and we were raiding one of his uh, one yeah. of his whiskeys while we oh, were. Brent, up there. Brendan's into a Belfast whiskey club, so uh, yeah, he's, he's yeah. just come to a Tom Goose all meet, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, no, I I had that was a great night. Actually, I walked back to my Airbnb after that, and people would probably say, "Are you crazy?" Because it was about a forty five minute walk through Belfast at two o'clock in the morning. And I said, I'm from Detroit. <laughs> I'm just, it does, it, it, it did, nothing here is making me nervous. So I just yeah, go yeah. on. No, and, Belfast uh, is, um, Belfast is a cracking spot. I love the place. I love visiting, love going there. So, um, I'm only good things to say. And it's a safe enough city these days, you know? Yeah. Um, it's a safe yeah. enough city. But listen, Drew, thanks very much for coming on for our chat. Um, sure. I really enjoyed it, actually. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, we must do it again. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next time we come to Ireland, no, next March for um, the two whiskey festivals. There you go. In May for Irish Whiskey Live Dublin. Um, we must uh, meet up and share a wee drop as well. And uh, we'll get you a few smoke bombs uh, just for your palate. <laughs> That's awesome. I will take it. No way I'm turning that down. Well, thank you so much, too, for having me on. This is fantastic. No, no, really enjoyed it. Uh, great chat. And I, I love I love the authority you speak. Um that you speak uh, with uh, on Irish whiskey because uh, there's not many people outside of Ireland, not many people. Uh, there's quite a few um, that can speak with authority. And, and um, I do feel like you're a good ambassador for Irish whiskey. Uh, so fair play to you. Keep her lit. Um, Thank you. And I really appreciate, I, I enjoy listening uh, to your content. So keep it up and um, I'll be, I'll be there in the background keeping tabs on you and um, sure might even try an old email or everything and keep you honest. All right. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Let me know when I'm going off base. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I Cheers, appreciate Drew. it. Thanks, All buddy. Right. Cheers.